been almost a year now. Uh, Norm brought to my attention a number of photos that are online uh, that uh, document the construction of the Wachusett Aqueduct. And there are literally hundreds of them, I guess. And uh, Norm's idea was to revisit some of the places, some of the sites where these uh, photos were taken, just to, mostly for the fun of it, but to document uh, any changes that might have uh, taken place uh, since the, the original photographs were taken. It was a labor of love. Uh, we had a lot of fun revisiting these sites and uh, uh, we, uh, when Norm first mentioned that uh, we should put on a program like this, I got the idea that some of the, uh, the seniors might be interested in seeing some of these then and now places as well. And so uh, that provided me a rationale for selecting some walks last fall for the senior walking group. Uh, walking group that, op that, that uh, leaves from the senior center every Thursday on, on, uh, in the fall and in the spring. And I see a couple of uh, our members here, so they'll, uh, they'll uh, recognize some of these pictures. We're gonna focus on the, just the part of the aqueduct that's in Northboro, and it's uh, on the order of four to four and a half miles through Northboro. Uh, this is a resource, this aqueduct is a resource. It's, uh, I think of it in terms of a scenic resource, a uh, historical resource. It's, um, uh, as pointed out here, it's one of uh, four places in Northboro that is on the uh, National Register of Historic Places. This building, by the way, is, is uh, one of the four. It, uh, and as, uh, as we point out here, it's a monument. It's a, it's probably one of the more photographed places in town. For example, Helen Cavalry, is, is Helen here? She took home most of the marbles last fall in our <laughs> photographic contest. Uh, she won not only the uh, first place for the, uh, for the sites and scenes in Northboro category, but she also won the People's Choice uh, for, for the two shots of the aqueduct. And we've seen many, many photographs of, of it. Uh, I, I call it Northboro's motif number one. <laughs> Again, well, I'll be talking about some of the construction methods. Um, there, are, there are 223, 223 photos of aqueduct construction. You can access these on a website, digitalcommonwealth.org. Uh, most of the photographs were by one photographer and he took, like I say, dozens of them. We returned to, to many of these places, and I think we ended up, Norm, with about uh, 88 or something like that, uh, now pictures. Uh, a little bit more about the, 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 the uh, digital services. I won't go into that right now. I did a little bit of research, but it, on the subject of construction before, or starting last fall, but, uh, we have a document in the records in the, in the historical archives that was prepared by Bob Kennelly in 1983. I think he gave a top, uh, talk on the subject then. And it's com very comprehensive. Uh, I went back to some of the original documents, but I found that he basically he'd covered the, the subject. It's a, it's a wonderful uh, summary of the construction of the aqueduct. As I mentioned, we're only gonna be talking about the aqueduct the part in Northboro, but his summary also talks about a tunnel, the tunnel, uh, the brim, uh, the and the cha open channel that is that extends into uh, Marlboro and Southboro. The Boston water supply started with wells and uh, springs in the immediate Boston area, and they moved out to Chestnut Hill and put in a reservoir there. And that didn't uh, service for very, uh, didn't provide the, uh, enough water for very long. Eventually had to move farther out and they started constructing the uh, Sudbury Reservoir. Well, first of all, a Kachichit Reservoir. And there's an aqueduct that uh, transports water into Boston from the Kachichit Reservoir. And they went, moved out farther out to the Sudbury Reservoirs and concurrently they were looking for alternative water supplies uh, because they recognized that uh, they, the city was growing, the metropolitan area was growing, and they needed alternatives. So they, they considered three major alternatives. So one, one was Lake 
Winnipeg C O G. <laughs> That's how they spelled it in their in their document. Lake Winnipesaukee in New Hampshire, uh, Merrimack River upstream from Lowell, and finally the Nashua River near Clinton. And uh, what they decided was that uh, this would be the most cost effective, but they were concerned mostly about water quality. They did some tests and discovered that they could treat the water, but they, there's always the element of human error. And because of that, they decided to go with the more expensive uh, option. Uh, Lake Winnipesaukee dropped out pretty fast because I, I think they figured they'd have a fight getting convincing New Hampshire that they could transport water in from, from New Hampshire. And so they settled on the uh, National River Basin uh, with a dam at Clinton. I discovered, I didn't realize it, but at the same time they were developing this water supply, they were looking at the next phase. And they had already selected the Swift River uh, as their next source of water. And eventually that became the Quabbin Reservoir. And that uh, construction there started in the 30s. When we talk about the aqueduct, sometimes people think the aqueduct bridge. The aqueduct, the aqueduct bridge. The aqueduct actually consists of, of uh, four components uh, that were contracted uh, for construction. There's a tunnel here. There's a uh, masonry aqueduct here that extends down to about the Northboro line. Uh, there's the bridge which is the third one, and then an open channel from approximately Northboro Marlboro line down into the Sudbury reservoirs. Uh, I want to bring to your attention this cross section here. Here's not, not too clearly shown, but maybe you could see. Uh, here's the land surface here. So the tunnel is in Clinton and Berlin. That's about two miles long. And then there's the masonry aqueduct that extends down to where it becomes an open channel here. And you can see uh, there's a lot of topography there. There had to be cuts, there had to be fills. And uh, it was quite an undertaking. What is amazing to me is that the construction, I mean, of course, there's a lot of pre-planning and they did a lot of borehole work and so forth, but they started in the spring of 1990, 1896 and it was done by the end of 1897, less than two years. I mean, they spent about two years rebuilding the Route 20 bridge over the aqueduct <laughs> over here. <laughs> it was uh, officially opened in 1905, but they actually uh, started transporting water in the spring of, eight, uh, of 1898, just a few months after it was completed. They started transporting water even before the Clinton Dam was completed. They had a, a temporary dam that they'd constructed for that purpose. A uh, lot of people, I guess if you throw enough people at a project, you can get the job done. Uh, at one point, they had over 2,000 men and lots of horses. And we'll show you some, some examples of the workforce. Now, this is how it's constructed. Uh, some of, sometimes they had to excavate, and they, this is the, the the appearance and excavation is a covered, earth covered. Uh, similarly, sometimes they had to fill, and so they filled in three foot lifts, rolled it, and then constructed the aqueduct and then covered it with an earthen cover. Dimensions, roughly about, uh, oh, about 11 feet high and uh, nearly eight, uh, 12 feet wide. Um, the, uh, See if we, the, the construction included uh, a cement cover, cement arch, and a brick lining. Here we have, they built these, uh, these sidewalls out of uh, uh, cement and then covered them with brick. There's also cement on the bottom, brick, liner, and then they came in with these arches and those served as forms then for a concrete cover. The arches, as I understand, were oiled so that they could be easily moved or removed after the, the cement was poured. Uh, as a kind of an aside, uh, I had a chance to talk to, uh, to uh, Stanley Sullivan 
before he died back in the mid-90s. And he said when he was growing up, there was still a lot of these arches around. People were using them for chicken coops, uh, outhouses, <laughs> you name it. And this would have been, in, I guess, in probably in the 20s. Okay, that gives you an idea. Here they're plastering the inside after it was built and they plastered the inside, provide a nice smooth uh, route for the water to follow. And this gives you a better, better idea of the dimensions of the, of the aqueduct. Uh, everything was done by hand. Almost everything was done by hand. Uh, all the cement was mixed by hand. It was pick and shovel. Um, here you can see they're, they're hauling uh, wheelbarrows of, of uh, cement, and dumping it into the forms. Uh, you have horses working here. They, it wasn't just, they didn't start at the beginning and work their way along. They actually were working uh, at several sections at the same time. They couldn't put all 2,000 men in one place, obviously. But it, did, it looks to be like it got pretty crowded out there. And it must have taken quite a bit of coordination to, to uh, make that work. Uh, they used hoist. They used some steam power. Uh, here we have cranes, and you, uh, this is a steam-powered hoist. Uh, they use steam for drilling. And here's the rollers uh, where they have had to fill. They, uh, they roll it every three inches, as they mentioned. Here's, uh, here they're digging. This is uh, just on the other side of the Asabet River, uh, going toward East, East Main Street up here. And you can see one shovel full at a time. Um, I think about that as I walk through there and think if someone hand me a shovel and say to go to it, and then you can see that uh, <laughs> a lot of work. And they had uh, uh, screens for screening the gravel. They used all of the, for the concrete work, they used all native materials except the, the cement itself. They had a rock crusher, steam operated rock crusher. This is looking down on the Aspert River at uh, at the woods, at, at the pond at Wood, Woodville. And they had uh, a lot of uh, work that was done to, they, they used granite uh, in, in a lot of uh, forms to construct the, uh, the bridge over the, uh, over the Aspect River. And Norm will talk a little bit more about that. So the uh, aqueduct bridge was lined with lead to keep to keep it watertight, and then the lead in turn was covered with brick. And uh, the conclusion was it was completely watertight. Well, apparently that wasn't, it's hard to make something totally watertight. And uh, they had some problems with leakage later on. The brick, almost all of the brick came from Epping, New Hampshire, and the granite for the bridge, as well as uh, several structures along the aqueduct, and the, uh, and the culverts came from Concord, New Hampshire, Rattlesnake Hill in Concord, New Hampshire. And there's still a quarry up there, by the way. I want to single out Epping. I grew up in Fremont, right there. And I feel a connection to the aqueduct. <laughs> in fact, this is the, the farm where I grew up. This is the old Portland to Rochester to Nashua Railroad, to Nashua to Worcester Railroad. And this would have transported the brick from Epping to, uh, to Clinton. So when the train got this far, it, uh, it was just building up steam. And we used to walk down the tracks and skate on a former clay pit and also fish for pickerel there. A uh, few modifications since it was built in uh, 1946. The aqueduct bridge became inactive and they put an inverted siphon through there. I understand it leaked like a sieve and it caused ice problems in the, in the winter. In 67, uh, uh, the aqueduct was nearly uh, supplanted by uh, the Cosgrove Tunnel, although it was still active transporting water to the state hospital and to the town of Northboro. Uh, from 1998 to 2005, it was reconditioned and reactivated while they were connecting the tunnel to the new treatment plant over in Marlboro. And since 2005, it's been uh, inactive, although it still serves as, as a backup. Uh, as we speak, they're 
building a connection between the uh, covered aqueduct, the masonry aqueduct, and the treatment plant so it would be fully uh, operational as if needed. And since 2014, uh, part of the aqueduct has been uh, open for passive recreation. Although people have been walking the aqueduct for decades. <laughs> um, just a little bit, uh, okay, this is the section that uh, Norm is going to be looking at here. And uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, uh, the numbering system. You can't read this very well, but you see there's some numbers here. Each photograph that was taken had a number, a station number. And that station number is, is a three-digit number, for example, 430. And that's the number of feet and hundreds of feet from the origin. So that gave us a clue as to where these pictures were taken. So if we could find a, a, a specific landmark, like a culvert, then we could pace off the distance and come very close to where the picture was actually taken. What we have is a series of then and now photographs from uh, the walk that Forrest took and I took down, down the aqueduct. Um, the black and whites are clearly from uh, construction days, and then the colors are from uh, what we were working on. So. Essentially what we're gonna do now is we're gonna, we're gonna walk the aqueduct. It's about four and a half miles. We're starting at the Berlin line and we're gonna end at the Marlboro line. And I've broken the, we've broken the presentation up in segments so we can see uh, different parts of the aqueduct. Uh, my intent here is so that you can now walk the aqueduct and see what's going on around you and, beh in, and below you. Um, later on you'll see what we have for plans for the future. So this is from the, the Berlin line to Whitney Street. So up on the top is, uh, a little, here it is. So up on the top we've got the Berlin Line and we've got the aqueduct and the green is the railroad which parallels the aqueduct. Um, there's a little kink right in here which is a, a, uh, comes up in the other slides. This is Whitney Street down here and this is uh, Coolidge Circle which runs pretty much parallel all the length of the, that's the section. But we also found some other pictures we just threw in. Uh, we don't know where they were taken but this is one. <laughs> So these are the engineers uh, working on the Metropolitan Waterworks. And what I really liked is their lighting apparatus as they're working through the tunnels and through the aqueduct. It's a couple of candles on their chest. Um, I imagine a few people got burnt. It looks like there's wax all over his clothes if you look real close. Um, so here we are, as uh, Forrest had mentioned, the, uh, this is really so we can take track of things. Uh, station number, number 234 is the distance, plus another 15, 17 uh, yards, I think it is. And we have a few culverts that we put in. There's, if you want, there's a lot of culverts, but we only ticked a few out. After a while, you can have too many. Uh, so there we are. It's October 19th, 1896, and they're starting to put the culvert in. This is the railroad track. So this is, again, up toward the Berlin Line. Um, this is when it was completed, and this is what it looks like today. You'll see this in a lot of these pictures. Uh, today, everything's in pristine condition, other than overgrowth with some weeds and some trees. It's in really good condition. I, that really surprised us. Um, so this is now uh, another view. Remember I said there was a kink, so these features help us tell us where to take the photographs to try to match. So you can see the railroad, because it parallels the railroad, and you can see the kink. And this is the photograph we've taken. You can see the kink right in here. And with all the growth over the 125 years, you can't see the railroad anymore. This is one thing you'll see. There's one thing that you see uh, through all the photographs. You look at this one, this doesn't look like the North Bro I know. It's all open farms, there's no trees, and now it's all, it's a grown up with the, the new tree growth. This photograph, so it's uh, 1897 during construction, this is standing at Whitney Street, on the bridge at Whitney Street looking toward Berlin. If you look really close, in these pictures you can blow them up, you can actually see the church steeples uh, in the town of uh, center of Berlin. The quality of these images are quite amazing. Uh, so this is after completion, and this is what it looks like today. There's this pine tree that's in our way, but this is what it looks like today with a few houses uh, right along the, uh, the path. So now we'll do uh, Whitney Street to Barefoot Road. So we got uh, Whitney Street to Barefoot Road. So Whitney's right uh, here. And then we got uh, Barefoot right here by the Senior Center. Uh, it goes, the Route 1290 clearly wasn't there when they built the thing. But we got the railroad again in the aqueduct parallel. And then at this point, they, they actually cross right uh, between Route 290 and the Barefoot Road. 
We have another photograph that uh, we found interesting. That, uh, not sure, we think he's either selling or repairing boots. We're not sure what's going on. Could also be an outhouse, but. <laughs> he, the fellow looks very happy. He's got his pipe, he's dressed to kill. I, um, but I, I, I hope that's not home. So during this stretch, it's all ledge. You know, I don't really follow the geography, the geology of the town, but this is all ledge through this route. So um, this, is, uh, this is the Whitney Street right up there, and look at all the ledge they had to plow through. And you saw from Forrest's information, this is, this, this is not easy going. <laughs> now you can see it today, it's all flat. You can see all the rock. They were, you know, the rock was all pulled out of here and just dumped. And as you walk the aqueduct in regions, you can see they just piled piles and piles of stone. This is culvert number seven under construction. Um, what I liked about this is uh, these guys are, I don't know if they're investors or supervisors, but they're certainly not working with a tie on and a bow tie and a nice hat. And these guys, you know, they, clearly they're the worker bees. But uh, it's always, in, I found it interesting to see how these early pictures show and then in the end, it's just a culvert, it doesn't look like much. But it's quite an effort to get this all put together. So this is the culvert uh, when it was done construction, and there it is today. Um, station 277. So this is uh, April of 1897 where they've cleared all the trees from the ledge. They haven't done any construction. Here you can see they had the, not only the construction, they really had to deal with uh, all the ledge to, to blast through and, and deal with. And there it is today. Again, you can, you can see a little bit of the railroad track here and just piles and piles. You walk this, is just piles of stone. Um, I don't know how many people have actually walked that, that part of the aqueduct and you go under the 290 bridge and we have an art gallery. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty talented stuff under there, huh, Forrest? We took a few pictures, but uh, I should be charging for people. So the Station 280, again, we're just showing all of the work. And as Forrest had mentioned before, you know, you look close and it's horses and picks and carts. It's, it's I mean, I just can't imagine how they did this in that day and age. And this work was done where right now 290 is. And if you drive down 290, that part of 290 is just steep because you're coming from the ledge down to the farmland. So it's, uh, it's going all downhill because all of that ledge that they had to cut through. Now we're getting close to uh, where the aqueduct had to go under the railroad tracks. This is just off of uh, Barefoot Road. Uh, this is how it is under construction. And then this is how it looks today. Um, so you can, you know, a lot of, when we were there, there were people walking their dogs and stuff. It's, it's uh, kind of open, that part, at least by, <laughs> just by people doing what they want. And the only reason I put this culvert in, it's a, it's a beautiful culvert, but it's right across the street, for, essentially across the street from the senior center. So you, you can just walk across <laughs> the street, follow the railroad tracks. If you've got a little bit of uh, dexterity, you can just, slide down the slope, and it's all there. It's really quite nice. Of course, we're doing stuff, some of this in the winter, which is a little tricky. Uh, so now we're right at Barefoot. This is Barefoot Road right here. You can see how it curves through. And today, uh, <coughs> this is Barefoot Road. This is an access road to one of the, a small industrial park. And you, that gate, you can see that green gate is still there. So now we're right across the street from the senior center. So we'll do Barefoot Road to the Assabet uh, River. Now, <coughs> again, this is the, the Greens of Railroad track. This is Edmond Hill, and this is the uh, aqu aqueduct. So uh, senior centers in between. They both took different paths around Edmond Hill. Um, keep in mind, the railroad track was probably put in about maybe 30 years before the aqueduct. It was more like uh, 1860s, and this is uh, 1890s. So you see how it curves around the hill. It, crosses barefoot, then it actually goes underneath Colburn and then underneath Rice before it comes across and then uh, Yel Yelnick has uh, properties in here. This nice straight place with, the, with another kink in it. Uh, the star is because that's uh, a property that no longer exists. It's the Hillard Sparrow House and it was quite a house. This was before construction. This is the uh, Colburn Street coming around. This is a t photo taken by David Benton back in 1971 and looks in beautiful condition. Colburn Street now, this would have been out after construction, but you can see the street. You know, this is what, well, what went to the Raytheon property, and now it's uh, the electrical company. Uh, National thank Grid. you, it's National Grid. I knew the answer, I just wanted to see if people were paying attention. 
So this is, I like this shot. It has nothing to do with the aqueduct. It's 18, 1969, but it's looking across the pond, and look at the complex. It's huge. You know, that's what it looks like. This is what it looked like in 1918. There's some also photographs from 1918, and uh, this is what it looks like now. Something's missing. But yeah, it just amazes me that in this time, even 1918, we had all dirt roads in town. I don't know, you know, I, you always take for granted everything's been tarred. One lane dirt roads for that matter. Uh, so we can, if you look hard enough, you can find a foundation that's still up, uh, it's up there in the hill. Um, and this one here is, <coughs> uh, Rice Street is to our back and we're looking toward Berlin. Um, and this is that long stretch that everybody cross country skis and walks because it goes from all the way here to Chapinville. And uh, you can see it today. It goes down and takes a right hand curve. So uh, the Assabet River crossing, we've got quite a few pictures of it because of the iconic nature of the bridge. And um, again, we're focusing in right, right in here. Uh, I, we started these because there were two old homes that are still in existence, kind of like a, um, a guide for where we're taking all our pictures because they're still in existence. And then we're really focusing on what's going on across the uh, river. So the way we started, I have it in two sections. One is we're standing on Hudson Street looking across. And then afterwards, we have it looking the other way from the other side, looking back. Because they, they, the, some of the pictures are a little bit better from different uh, angles. So the intersection of Allen Street and Hudson Street, this is before construction. This is the house that's there. This is the house that's there. And this is the same picture today. Um, what's funny is you can't see this house because <laughs> of the trees. And then this one, you can't see this house because of the trees. But um, the intersection is still there. Those houses are still there. And they haven't changed much. So now we're looking from Hudson Street across the river. This is before construction. Um, you can see a little peak there. Well, it turns out it's, that, it's the barn on this house that still exists today. Um, and this one here, uh, I don't have it on this one. but So now we're looking across, and it's starting to cut the trees down. They're starting to put the, a dam in to work for the, for the bridge itself. So it's the very early stages of construction. You've seen this photo already from uh, Forrest, but what we're trying to show here is you know, if you look close, these blocks are all numbered. They're not just randomly putting these blocks in. They, it's like a big jigsaw puzzle to build this bridge. Um, and if you look closely at the slide, I didn't point it out before, every slide has a section number and a distance on it, and every slide has the date that it was taken. So everything is traceable. So this one's October 9th, and this is the same angle today. You can still see the house in the background on uh, Allen Court. Uh, this, I want to compare the dates now. So this is October 9th. This is six weeks later. They're already onto the third arch. They're not wasting any time. And you can still see the two houses there. So they were working pretty quick. Um, this is just looking at a different angle, but the reason we kept this picture in, uh, we use this house as kind of a reference, and is now this, the arches are done, and now they're above the arches, starting to do the brickwork to get the aqueduct uh, for the, you know, the tunnel for the water. This is near the end of completion. The only thing I can see that's not complete is because there's no um, rail up yet. There's no rail on it. So we have, I didn't blow this up. These look like a bunch of serious uh, uh, investors or bankers or something. And then there's people riding their bikes. I really got a kick out of the people riding their bikes. And it's the same shot today. You can see the road curves under the bridge. Um, and then this is one of the iconic photographs. They're uh, working on the bridge. What, I forget what they're rolling on the top uh, for us. This is, what's that? This is the, on the top of the bridge, they put, they're rolling out something. Uh, I, I'm not sure about that. Oh. I, I know but it's covered by asphalt. Uh, they might have put a, put a sub layer on it of some kind. So we got this shot, we have these people on the bridge, and uh, Forrest didn't want to do it, but he did trespass. <laughs> So I got uh, Forrest, just don't tell anybody, I got Forrest standing in the same spot on the bridge. But uh, nobody saw that. <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing is, you know, this is, these are great views, but now it's all overgrown with, with trees and bushes and whatnot. You lose a lot of the views. Yeah. Now, we're, now we're on the other side looking back. Uh, so it's the same thing, before construction, nothing looks exciting. Um, but now they're starting to, to clear the area just beyond this house for the for the aqueduct. This is before construction, so this is the Allen Street Bridge over the, uh, over the river. 
it's a nice picketed fence, really nice, but now you know, <laughs> times have changed and people go fast and it's not quite the same look. But you get the bridge in the background, but the house is still there. That old that little house, it's, it's actually for sale, I think. Um, I like these pictures because now they show, so you get the archways done. Now they're building, they're building where they have to have the, the tunnel for the water to flow. And in this, so this is uh, 97 in uh, June. By July, they've got all the steel work that's the ceiling of the tunnel uh, done. Um, and this is the inside of the tunnel. This is what the bridge looks like. It's uh, the steel work on the top, all the brickwork, the brickwork on the side, and then you can see the, uh, you, well, you can see obviously the, where the water would have been flowing. And this is the bridge is almost complete. We can, because there's no railing, and this is the same angle uh, today. Uh, it's just so much of the bridge is uh, hidden by trees now. This one is right after completion. The railing is up. I highlighted this because if you walk down there, there's a nice set of stairs to bring you right to the top of the, to the aqueduct. It's clear that this was a place to walk when they built it. I can't find any pictures of people on it. I can't find any pictures of someone celebrating that it was opened, but it was designed to be walked on. It didn't have a chain link fence with a lock, which uh, isn't, isn't the too intimidating, is it? Yeah. <laughs> You just jump the fence. <laughs> so, and if you look at it today, it's all there. I mean, it needs a little love and care, but it's not derelict. So we'll go Assabet River to Maple Street. Um, so it comes down from the Assabet River. We cross East Main, which was there when they built it. We cross Main Street, which was not there when they built it. Then there's a kink at the end when we get down to Maple Street, and there's the police station to give you an idea where things were. So this is totally different. This is lots of gravel, and, and, and certainly you've seen some of these pictures already from Forrest, but now you'll know where to look for the, where those pictures were taken. So this is the same photograph. And this is the house. It's still there. This is East Main now. So right at East Main, where the, where the road crosses the aqueduct, they had this structure for, for grading. They had all these guys digging holes. I mean, six guys. I, I can't imagine six guys dug that whole thing. <laughs> I mean, that's 50 feet down. Um, and then you get your, your horse and wagons. And if you walk it today, it's interesting. It confused me at first because I thought I was walking on this high land, which was the aqueduct, but that's not the case. The aqueduct is in the trench. The aqueduct is down. This is as, as they were building that whole area. And again, for our purposes, you know, we know it's station 366. We know where we are, and we take a photograph of where it is. And you can see now this is just before you get to the Route 20 uh, bridge, Main Street Bridge. And that's about where that's about where this sorter was for uh, for the gravel. So as, as as Forrest alluded to before, this is gravel. They're making concrete. Boy, that's a gift because they just take the gravel and use it in the concrete. No, nobody has to pay for it. This is just about getting to Maple Street, and it would, uh, this area got flooded. Uh, this is what it looks like today. And you know, you look. We're looking for things like you can see this berm here. You can see this berm here. We know we're in the right area. The pictures really match up quite good. I circled this because it's going to come up in a couple of slides, but you can see in the distance there's some buildings. And in, in the next slide or two, I'll show that. So now uh, we're at Maple Street and we're going to Stirrup Brook. <coughs> so uh, these are the buildings we'll be showing, and it's a straight shot with a little kink just before we get to where Stirrup Brook exits uh, Bartlett Pond. So this fascinated us. So this is that image I was looking at. There's a barn or something here, but you can see this house in the background. What's this house? And if you look real close, you can see this house in the background. They're right, they're sitting there on Bartlett Street. So these old homes are all part of the town when the construction was built. Um, they're well over 100 years old. They're well over 100 years old, yeah. Um, this one's probably closer to 200, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, if you stand on Maple Street and look toward Bartlett Street, you see where the aqueduct is and there's this, this, this uh, draining trench that they put in, it's like a brook. And it's still there today, everything's still there today, other than you know, this, all this open farmland is gone. It's all trees, and actually now there's, just beyond that is a couple of ranch houses. Here they were moving boulders. They were digging, there's a lot of boulders they were moving. Again, you know, you, you just get your basic ax and go to town. Um, horses, and this is the area today. It's the same section 397 is what it looks like today. So the, they have these photographs of this house. This house, they called it the Clark House. This house and Turns out it's the same house. It took us a while to figure that out. But Forrest went back, and this is the house on uh, Bartlett Street. It's still there, and this is the back of the house. The interesting thing with this house, it makes you think. This is a town map. This is the property ownership. So that's that house. 
This is their house and barn. This is the aqueduct. And this is the other land they own. So think about this. Someone knocked on their door one day and said, we're putting an aqueduct through your backyard, and I'd like to know how that conversation went. <laughs> so now we'll just deal with uh, Stirrup Brook. I like this area more, I actually like this area more than the, over the aqueduct bridge, because it's, it's pretty unique. Um, this is before the aqueduct was construction, constructed. I don't know if you realize, but um, the Bartlett, Bartlett Pond was raised about three feet by Daniel Wesson, so he could have water for his mansion, the White Cliffs. So he built a dam, he built a spillway, beautiful spillway, a nice bridge. So this is Bartlett Street. It's actually a very nice area. It's a nice stone bridge. You got the waterfall going here. He even put a little kink in the wall to save that tree. This road goes to his pump house, which is, there's only some of it left. It's not all there anymore, but it's a, it's a very pretty area. Then the aqueduct came through. So this is it before construction, which, uh, and this is after construction. So now we're looking, the, the pond is on my left, so we're looking toward Main Street. This is the waterfall, which you can clearly see if you were taking your horse and pony down this road. And this is the nice, a nice wall here. But after construction, the wall is still there, but the road is lifted about 50 feet because the aqueduct went over the old road. So now you, you can't see the waterfall. Uh, you can see there's some nice construction down here. But what, it's nice here because they have all the, uh, it's all grass, so you can see things. Um, so it's kind of pretty. This is actually, I think it's a gatehouse that controlled the water level for uh, Weston's uh, water needs. The reason I took this photograph is if you, if you slide down the hill, which is all trees now, you can go in, that wall is still there, the wall is still there, the end cap is still there, and the construction is still there, and even that little place where they had that, that tree they were saving is still there, except the tree's not there a little indent. It's all preserved. It's all stayed up to the test of time. And now this is uh, again looking at what, the, so this is after construction and this is what it looks like today. You really can't see anything because of all of the overgrowth. And this is one last view because uh, this is after construction, September 1899, and this is what Bartlett Street looked like back then. It was just a little dirt road, one lane for a couple of horses. <coughs> they had, because they lifted the road, they also had to change the construction of the bridge and they had to change the waterfall and how it came all through uh, Stirrup Brook. So this is the inlet. So I'm standing in the water essentially of the pond and they had to go in and rebuild everything. You can see all the construction work. This is what it looked like when they were completed. You can see the new stone work from the, uh, because they put the aqueduct in. And then there's the old western stone work right, abut right abutting it. And this is what it looks like today. It's all there. Too bad that bush is there. It's all there. It's actually a nice spot to walk because you get the waterfall going. It's a very pretty spot that I don't think anybody knows exists. And this is on the back side. So this is the ponds up here, and now this is the back side. So they're, doing, they're building all of the stonework. This is this new wall that they put in for retaining wall. This is the old wall. Remember, the wall road was actually below that wall. So you can see how high up they had to build. Um, and it's all there today. It's best to go in the winter when there's no leaves, but it's all, it's all there. And for those who, uh, the Western Pump House, just as a little story, the Western Pump House was there. Uh, you don't see it anymore, and if you go in the woods, you can see the basement. Just the stonework from that side is still existing. If you sneak, sneak through the property. It turns out I didn't realize it's private property, but. We're near the end. I hope we're all not tired from me or from the walk. Um, <laughs> so this is the last part. This is where Bartlett Street goes and the aqueduct goes around the corner. This is Rock Hill, so they stayed away from Rock Hill. The railroad went on the back side of Rock Hill, and then again, they, they crossed right at the Marlboro Line. For those who know, this is Dewey Pile and FedEx, right on Bartlett Street, uh, right on the hill. So, Mills Farm, I put, I put that big X there because of, uh, yeah, because of Mills Farm. And this is Mills Farm in September 1899. The aqueduct went in front of it. This is another photograph from 1970. It's not that long ago. Um, and there it is today. If you look close, you can find the barn foundation. You can't find anything else that's, that's on the property. And someone asked earlier about who, who built this thing and where they lived. Thank God it's not what I would live in. It's the Italian camp. It was right near Bartlett Street. Uh, this is the housing. That's what they were living in. I don't know what they got paid, um, but it hopefully was enough to justify that. But uh, it was pretty primitive, I was surprised. But that's right, and if you walk down, if you walk on the aqueduct on the left-hand side, you can see sections where there's a lot of stones. 
and that's probably very close to where they had their camp. This is just another example uh, uh, Forrest made note of. These are all bricks getting ready to pile up, getting ready for when they actually build the, the as they go through, and this is where you could walk. That's pretty walking. You go about halfway down, you don't feel like you're in off-row anymore. It's all, it's all uh, rustic. Oh, wrong way. Station 466 is flooded. Um, and you can see where it turns. And this is the same exact picture. See how it turns? I thought this was the aqueduct. Yeah. Mm. No, it's under the swamp at this point. Oh. It's why it's flooded. So they had to deal with the fact that the floods, the water from Crane Swamp was also getting in there. So it's under the swamp. Then they had to build the bridge. So this is the, this is the train tracks. So they had to get the aqueduct under. Um, again, it looks like more people inspecting than working. <laughs> and you can, this is a similar shot today. You can see the, the train tracks, and this is where the aqueduct would be under this, the swamp. This is a picture taken in 1918 of this whole area. Um, it doesn't look like North Bro at all. It's all open land. But surprisingly, those towers are still there. So those towers are 125 years old. That's the Northboro Marlboro line. We're still in Northboro. Uh, now we're in Marlboro. This is the uh, terminal chamber. It's where it goes from being underground to being an open water channel. It's right at the line. Probably you throw a rock to the line. Um, and this is what it was after building. And this is, again, these, are, these people are not working. <laughs> And they look at the chariots. I mean, we, this is the only picture we have these nice chariots and nice white horses, two horses. So somebody uh, was on a tour. So this is, uh, the good news is they're, they're rebuilding the roof and not taking a wrecking ball to it. So that's a good thing. So that's, that's a good sign. Uh, there's some of our next steps. Um, all the current photographs and the old photographs are in a three ring binder over there that we're donating to the Historical Society. Um, there is, we're planning to put along the aqueduct several of, several of these pictures on temporary markers so people who walk the aqueduct can actually say, oh, I never realized that this was here before. So we're going to do that. For those who don't know it, the Trails Committee in Northboro are working with the uh, MWRA to open the aqueduct over the Assabet River for pedestrians. So they're already starting that. Um, this has been done before for other aqueducts closer to Boston. Uh, the Wabin Arches Bridge and the Echo Bridge. It's still years away, but it's been done before. We just have to figure out how they did it. Um, the last slide is, this is the Sudbury Aqueduct off Echo Bridge, built in 1877. It's now a pedestrian walkway. So people want to find out how to get, so we can walk over the Assabet River. It's been done before, and I think it's just a matter of getting the right people talking to each other. So thank you. I hope we didn't run too long, but thank you.